We are so grateful to welcome Dr. Robert Reiki back to the state. He has practiced family medicine since 1985 and he is board certified in lifestyle medicine. He is chair of the board of his medical group and head of its family medicine division. He is a board member for plant-based prevention of disease, nutrition, and lifestyle, and he has been vegan since 1977. Please welcome back to the stage, Dr. Robert Grady. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I also want to thank Mary Beth and Mary Beth uh, for such a kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here again and uh, again now for part two, which is instead of 10 top things you want to know, my eight keys. Uh, first, a little background though. Let's go back to my last day of medical school, April of 1981. Our professor gets up to us in front of a room much like this. Here we are graduating. He says, tomorrow you all will graduate from one of the top medical schools in the world, University of Michigan. He was right about that. And then he said, unfortunately, half of what we've taught you is wrong. And we kind of look at each other like, is she joking or something? He says, further unfortunately, we don't know which half. <laughs> and it turned out he was right about that too. Because uh, as some of you may recall, uh, you know, we used to teach don't let your babies uh, sleep on their back, they might aspirate. Now we know that uh, that decreases the risk of SIDS. There were these medications called beta blockers that were contraindicated after a heart attack. And now we know they're life-saving. But nowhere was there misinformation for us more wrong than in the paltry amount of nutrition that we got. They taught us that animal protein was preferred because it was more like us. They taught us that fiber was this superfluous extra part of food that doesn't matter, it just passes right through you. And that heme iron was the preferable way to get your iron because it's 100% absorbed and you can get better uh, quality um, bug counts from that. I went on to kind of say, boy, if so much, remember by that time I'd already been uh, plant-based for four years, I went on to say, if, if what they're teaching us in nutrition is so wrong, I'm gonna really dedicate my career to, to finding out what really is true there. Uh, this is me in 1989 with my, my daughter, and I keep this picture in my office still as a, a memory of my early days. She's so cool now, she's, she's 35, didn't want to go into medicine, but she works for Amazon. About that same time, I realized that over and over for patients, I was right in the same directions. You know, eat healthy, drink water, exercise. So I put it into a formal format called Dr. Bob's Eight Keys for Health and Success. And for thousands of my patients now, over the last 39 years, I've given them this handout and said, hey, you know, here's an overview for you. And uh, in a new talk I've never quite put together before, you all are the first to see my chance to say, let's go through these and walk through and see what they mean. Here are the eight keys in summary. Eat for health, drink water, avoid cow's milk, eat fiber. You notice the four, first four have to do with what you're taking in your body. It's a big difference. And then be active, uh, make sure your environment's well um, balanced, uh, sleep well, and take time for play and relaxation. Kind of reminds you of the ACLM vision uh, with the uh, six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Uh, I'm not saying I invented those, but these are cornerstone ways of helping lifestyle over the years for people to say, how are we going to help people to empower them to get to the root cause of disease and prevent or reverse where possible. These are the pillars of lifestyle medicine and these are my eight keys. First, eat for health. Uh, choose abundant vegetables, whole grains, fruits and beans, nuts and seeds, including some ground flaxseed every day. Uh, this number one goes on to say, minimize and ideally eliminate animal foods, meat, dairy and eggs. Minimize refined sugar, salt, oil and other processed and ultra processed foods. Um, and then furthermore, fill your pantry with health-supporting foods so that your health becomes your primary mean for eating. Uh, eat when you're hungry and choose foods that both taste great and support you and your health goals. Take vitamin B12, 100 micrograms daily or if over 65, 1,000. And uh, this is your one supplement, of course, that's essential. So I put it right there in the key. Let's explore this one a little further. Uh, and the reason that I put it first is that standard American diet has now surpassed smoking as the leading cause of death and disability. Uh, over these last uh, s seven, eight years, uh, we've seen that this now is our leading cause of most of the chronic disease that I see in my office every day. And it really has to do with putting foods into one of four quadrants. And I, I pull this up for people and say, okay, pretty easy to understand. Animal on the left, plant on the right, 
uh, unprocessed down below and processed above. So you see here processed animal foods. Up here, at least it looks similar to the way nature presented it. Over here is processed plant foods, unrecognizable for what kind of plant they may have started from. And up here, of course, is fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and, and legumes, uh, along with nuts and seeds. Again, as Dr. Gregor has well pointed out, the dividing line between healthy and unhealthy is not just one side or the other or one top or the bottom. Sure, you can tell me you're vegan and you've eliminated this whole side, and that's good, good job, but you can still be vegan and eating French fries, Coca-Cola, Oreos, and Captain Crunch. Uh, so you want to eat on the upper part. Or conversely, if someone says, oh, I'm paleo, I don't eat any processed foods, I just eliminate everything on the bottom, you're still eating these foods that are very high in cholesterol, saturated fat, animal protein, and not healthy. So the dividing line is right here, and as we're going through this one, continue to think in terms of there. But as, as we help people to see that upper right corner is the way to be, let's back up and say, what makes a food health supporting? I mean, we won't go into the detail here, but these are the characteristics. Rich in antioxidants, it should be high in dietary fiber, alkalinizing, free of cholesterol, anti-inflammatory, not pro-inflammatory, phytonutrient rich, and a balanced set of macronutrients, that is fats, proteins, and carbs. And if you look at the first one, antioxidants, uh, plant foods have an average of 64 times more antioxidants in animal foods, which are nearly devoid. It's not just 64% more, it's 64 fold more antioxidants because these fruits and vegetables produce these themselves to, their, to survive photosynthesis. The animals eat those plants and then they use them up in their process of extinguishing free radicals. So when you eat plant foods, you're getting rich antioxidants in animal foods, almost none. What about fiber? <clears throat> High in fiber, this is where is the non-digestible part of plant foods. So that only comes from plant foods, prevalent in beans and whole grains especially, but also fruits and vegetables and a zero in animal foods. Alkaline, uh, yes, especially fruits and vegetables are alkalinizing. And animal foods, because of the high content of cysteine and methionine in their proteins, are actually acidic and put a strain on the kidneys, the bones, and the entire system. So we've got alkaline, yes, actually acidic on the other side, the opposite. Free of cholesterol, yes, uh, plant foods have no cholesterol in any of them. Uh, and animal foods, especially the fatty part, uh, deep meat, dairy, and eggs, uh, all have cholesterol just like we have in our systems. We make all we need, so we don't need to eat it, uh, but the animals make it too, and people who eat those foods get it in their, in their diet, increasing their serum cholesterol and their risk for heart disease and stroke. <clears throat> Inflammation is a huge one the, uh, because of the rich antioxidants and phytonutrients and the fiber that nourishes the microbiome. Plant foods go around and put out inflammation. In contrast, animal foods, because of the heme iron, which is actually a pro-oxidant in red meat and shellfish, because of the choline in eggs and the carnitine in meat, which are metabolized to trimethylamine oxide, huge pro-inflammatory response that goes throughout the body. Uh, chicken and eggs are especially high in arachidonic acid, which is the substance our own bodies use to induce inflammation. When you step on a splinter or get, uh, step on a nail or get a splinter, you need that, but uh, you're eating inflammation when you eat chicken or eggs. Phytonutrients, uh, phyto stands for plant, so only from plant source. And these are over 30,000 different compounds, possibly up to 100,000 as we discover more and more, that are not vitamins, you don't die without them, but you don't have health without them. And if you want health and vitality, success in everything you do, you want a diet rich in phytonutrients, and we're gonna come back to these later on. Animal foods, none. And then balanced macronutrients, about 80% uh, complex carbs, 10% fat and protein, with healthy versions of each of those versus the very high in saturated fat, animal protein, inflammation, insulin resistance. So mm, are we seeing a pattern here? <laughs> Is this just a coincidence that the foods from the plant kingdom are nourishing, give us health and vitality, future wellness, and the animal foods are actually creating inflammation, and chronic disease for us? No, no coincidence. This is what we are designed to eat. We have evolved over millions of years, like our closest relatives, to be uh, herbivorous, to be eating 98 plus percent whole plant foods. And those that are confused and say, well, during that paleo period, we were hunter-gatherers. Even then, which is only about 10% of human evolution, uh, it was still mostly plants because they ran a lot slower than animals. We are plant eaters and health supporting from plant foods, animal not. And that's why my key number one emphasizes this piece. Let's dive a little deeper on this though. Oh, I want to say this is also consistent with the 
American College of Lifestyle Medicine reversal plate. And if you haven't seen for this, uh, just search ACLM uh, plate or uh, plant-based reversal plate. Uh, and you'll see they can encourage half fruits and vegetables, a quarter nuts, uh, seeds, and beans, and a quarter whole grains, and give people a good idea for how to help accomplish that. So this is kind of becoming the mainstream for lifestyle medicine now. One of the main questions I get though, and you see in my key is I eliminate, ideally eliminate, uh, minimize if you can't eliminate, but a lot of people ask me, okay, this is gonna be challenging. How am I gonna do this? How whole food plant-based do I need to be? There are several variables that help determine that. One is your goal. You know, do you want to just be a little sick or do you want to be vital? Uh, do you have genetics that may be stacking the deck against you? Uh, do you have uh, other habits like smoking or lack of exercise that may put it against you? So all those things, but the American Dietetic Association says moderation in all things. Well, that makes no sense at all. All things like grass and toadstools? I mean, those are things. You don't eat those. They're not food. Well, neither are eggs or chicken when you look at it from the perspective of what nourishes us. Moderation, how do you define that? You know, to one person, well, I eat less than half junk food, so that's moderation. Um, and they also say there are no bad foods, only bad diets. Really? <laughs> are there no bad cigarettes? Only bad packs of cigarettes? Um, every bite you eat, every choice you make is a vote for whether health or not. And I'd like to put it this way, the percent of calories from whole food plant-based is a good marker for your, your healthfulness of your diet. The standard American diet, unfortunately, is only 11% whole food plant-based, 57% processed, and 32% animal foods. And we'll put that way over here on the left then, the standard American diet at 11%, uh, one out of 10. In contrast, the power plate uh, from PCRM is over here at 95% plus uh, plant-based, whole food plant-based. And there are a lot in between. Um, but if you look at these in-between ones, I kind of put markers here as you go up the scale. The red ones are still evidence that even as you get to 70%, you're still inciting or accelerating many of the common chronic diseases we see, uh, whether it's cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity. Uh, and only here in the orange you get to sort of later, slower progression and then here with mitigate and arrest. And this makes sense because even small amounts of these foods, just like small amounts of cigarettes, can have adverse effects. Um, but a lot of people say, well, I eat the pyramid or the Mediterranean diet or Pritikin. Well, good for you. The more you move up this scale, the better. But because there's overwhelming evidence that the Mediterranean diet is better than the standard American diet, doesn't mean that that's the best. There's also overwhelming evidence that smoking low tar and nicotine cigarettes are better for you than smoking full tar cigarettes, but that doesn't mean they're good for you. Uh, so you see the principle there. You move down the scale, and the further you get towards whole food plant-based, the better. As you go up in percent whole food plant-based, down goes your risk of chronic disease. We see this in population studies, the Adventist Health Study, um, uh, with over 100,000 participants, shows a body mass index, um, and people who eat a little bit to, to some to more meat. And by the way, all these people are otherwise healthy. They don't smoke, they exercise, they, they have social connectedness. <clears throat> but the vegans were the only ones that had normal weight. Uh, and similarly, type 2 diabetes prevalence, only about one third in those not eating uh, animal foods versus those eating. So the chronic disease risk for these foods is very much like smoking. When someone says, you know, can I have this? I said, sure, you know, you can smoke if you want, but this is what, what part of your risk is. Uh, so just like chronic disease risk goes down, the less you smoke uh, and zero is best, that's true for many foods too. Uh, so in this article from uh, National Geographic, after a study showing high protein diets in middle age may be as harmful as smoking, uh, and then Dr. Barnard who's speaking, I think this weekend, uh, plant-based diets are the equivalent, nutritional equivalent of, of quitting smoking. So that's what I try to help my patients see with this key number one, you have a big influence on how you do. So now it's uh, quiz, quiz time. Uh, if a patient asks me, can I eat or drink X? And the answer, of course, is yes, you can do whatever you want. It's legal, uh, and uh, if you, just like with smoking, though, if you want the lowest possible risk, your best possible intake of that is zero. So give me some ideas. What might you fill in that blank with? Chicken? Yeah, chicken, right? The less, the better. What else? Cheese, yeah, chicken and cheese, two of the leading causes of American disability. What else? Soda, Soda yeah, absolutely. Bacon. bacon, oh yeah, bacon and processed meats. Eggs, yeah, good one. 
Yeah, lots of possible answers, right? Many correct answers here. And uh, a lot of people think like, uh, well, I could never do this because I can't give up, uh, you know, my little bit of cheese on my salad. Well, then don't, you know, don't make perfect the enemy of good, but still recognize that any amount is not good, it's not healthy. And one of the common confusions here is with alcohol and wine, the sort of J curve that sort of made it think that teetotalers were less well off than some drinking small amounts of alcohol. We know now that this one too, the optimal amount is zero. Does it mean you can never have a glass of wine or beer? No, again, do what you want, but just recognize that it's part of your overall pattern and the less the better. So general principles, not all or nothing. There's no threshold effect, any amount can cause challenge. The more you do, the better your health gains, the earlier you start, the better, but it's never too late. You can't change the past, but you can change your future. The next step is to avoid what I call messing up a good food. A lot of people think that this typical healthy American meal, you know, rice and a glass of milk, a piece of salmon, a piece of fruit and broccoli. Okay, it's about half fruit and vegetable, right? Uh, and it's uh, about a half these other things. Well, not really if you look at it by calorie density. This apple's only 90 calories, broccoli 30, 150 for the glass of milk, rice 160, and here 240 for the salmon. So if you look at it now, the calories per serving here, adds up to 670 for this meal. And these are the whole food plant-based, the apple and the broccoli, and it's 120. These other calories from non-whole food plant-based sources mean this meal is only 18% whole food plant-based. Are you with me? It looks like by volume, it's half. Um, but the milk doesn't count, that's just an aside, and these others may half my plate. But remember that volume, so if we look at our picture again and make these measure it with what, they're, with what size they're bringing to the calorie percentage, this meal is 88% non-whole food plant-based. Are you with me still? So the correlate to that is it's, uh, and this has to do with calorie density, and plant foods tend to be low in calorie density, high in nutrient value. Uh, the animal foods, uh, processed foods, very high, and especially oil. What happens then if we just add a little cheese to that broccoli? You know, that's going to be okay, right? It's just a cup of broccoli and a third of a cup of cheese. Well, the cheese sauce, here's a typical recipe, is 230 calories versus the 30 calories for the broccoli. So you guessed it, uh, suddenly 260 calories, 30 divided by 260. Now you've made this meal that looks like it's three quarters broccoli and one quarter cheese sauce, right? A cup and a third of a cup into something that's only 12% whole food plant-based. So a lot of people look at their plate by volume. Another uh, common mess up of good food is salad. People take a big whole pound of salad, 100 calories, cucumbers and tomatoes, carrots, broccoli and salad, lettuce and spinach. And then they put just two tablespoons of either ranch or oil-based uh, Italian dressing on there for another 140 calories. You just made that 70% fat. You just made that 100% whole food plant-based meal. Now that doesn't mean you have to just eat it plain. You can use this vinegar on there, lemon juice, uh, all kind of great dressings you can make uh, that are vegan and healthy. But remember that principle that calorie density also drives what percent your diet is really in terms of the whole food plant-based part. Uh, so if we're gonna put these in the size, here's what you're, here's what you're uh, really getting whole food plant-based, here's what you're getting for the non-plant part. Um, so it gets even worse than this because the messing up often cancels out the benefits of the whole food plant-based. And again, in How Not to Age, Dr. Greger talks about how coffee contains a great phytonutrient called col uh, colorogenic acid. And if you add milk, the casein in that milk, the dairy proteins in there, wipe out the benefit from that. The polyphenols and teas, same thing, even small amounts. It cancel out the anti-inflammatory, artery function enhancing, immune support effects from coffee and tea. Uh, other benefits like with beer, for berries or chocolate are also canceled out. So dark vegan chocolate can have great benefits. Milk chocolate, canceled. It gets even worse when you, when you mess it up. So next time you consider messing it up, instead of broccoli and cheese sauce, get a you know, traditional yeast uh, based cheese sauce. Uh, um, plantiful kiki has a good recipe. Uh, you can just Google it, uh, vegan cheese sauce. Uh, coffee and tea, use a little dash of soy milk, if anything. Um, ranch uh, dressing and oil dressing, use a little 18-year balsamic, uh, sour cream, or uh, ranch dressing, get some veggies and hummus. So a lot of good ways to help avoid the messing up a good food phenomena. And again, we reviewed this, but that's the key, number one. Number two is drink water. 
And it says not only drink plenty of water, but avoid uh, most non-water beverages. Uh, water is our thirst quencher. It makes up uh, a good majority of our body. And coffee or tea in moderation can, can be good too. Just skip the cream and sugar as we just discussed. And then beverages with alcohol, fat, sugar, other artificial ingredients, slow us down, interfere with sleep cycles, increase obesity, should be enjoyed only on occasion. Uh, you notice the juicing too. We encourage a Vitamix or blending so the fiber is still there. We're gonna come back to this in the fiber chapter um, when we get to, to limiting juicing. How much to drink at any given time? Snapshot so as most adults are 20 to 30 percent are dehydrated, increasing risk for several challenges. And uh, younger people can look at their urine color when it's dark and amber like this, drink some water. Uh, but in older folks, that's not so reliable. So remember to uh, drink your water even between meals. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> so you keep hydrated. Evidence is four to seven cups a day for women in addition to the four cups you get in your food. Being plant-based, we tend to get more in our food uh, and uh, six to 11 cups for men. The reason for the big range there has to do with, it depends on ambient temperature, how much you're exercising, sweating, losing through other sources. But don't fall behind on water. On the other hand, don't overdo it too. If you drink too much, you get uh, water a dilution of critical electrolytes. So um, those are good guidelines for you. Next, it's a whole category of its own because like I mentioned on Thursday, so many people are still confused thinking that milk is a good source of protein or calcium. Not so much in this group, but I help my people, uh, my patients see that milk is perfect, nature's perfect food for baby cows. Uh, it's an unnatural component of human nutrition. Uh, no other mammal drinks milk after infancy, especially not milk of another mammal. And a majority of the world's population is lactose intolerance. They can't metabolize the milk sugar. And why should they? After weaning, no mammals should have to uh, drink milk. Um, so they get bloating right away if they drink it. It's more than half fat, uh, high in saturated fat cholesterol. 70% of the rest is sugar. A lot of people who wouldn't drink soda don't realize that skim milk is 70% sugar and a very poor quality sugar. Not only does lactose cause a lot of diarrhea and bloating in many people, but it metabolizes to galactose, a sugar that they use to induce premature aging in laboratory rats, uh, thought to be due to, our, part, part due to milk's linkage with diabetes and insulin resistance. It always contains bovine estrogen, so even people that say, oh, I drink hormone-free milk. No such thing. Mammals have, have, <laughs> have uh, hormones, and when cows are, are pre pregnant, they get especially high amounts, goes into their milk, and nearly always contaminated with antibiotics, growth stimulants, and will come to bovine leukemia virus, uh, pus cells, and environmental toxins. So uh, I put a whole key for itself, because so many people are confused. Again, not here, but uh, so many great alternatives now, too, from soy, flax, yogurts and milks uh, that you can get nutrition uh, in these plant-based versions. Uh, unfortunately, the Got Milk and other advertisements have been so prolific and uh, successful that people are still fooled about this. I won't go into all the detail, but I could do a whole hour on milk if you want me to next year. Uh, but uh, even if it were just this one thing, you, people which should, should be avoiding milk. It turns out that most milk is contaminated with bovine leukemia virus. Um, now, we used to think, oh, well, bovine is cow leukemia. It's not going to hurt humans, right? First of all, almost all are now infected. 100% uh, of large dairy herds, which represents the majority, uh, were infected by this virus. Um, and for the first time, uh, they studied uh, breast cancer cells, and they looked to see that they had the, the DNA from this virus stitched into their DNA. Now we know that viruses can cause cancer, um, uh, the AIDS virus with the Kaposi sarcoma, the HPV virus with cervical cancer. There are many examples of this. We know that viruses can cause DNA that lead to cancer, but this shows a strong evidence now that this particular virus in milk and in maybe raw red meat too, people who eat their steaks rare, may be associated with as much as 37% of breast cancers. If it were only this, you should avoid milk. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that, as I mentioned. Next is fiber. Health supporting foods contain fiber, and the real key on this one is to recognize the processing part. Um, we talked about the animal component, but whole foods like uh, whole grains are slowly digested. They provide the nutrients more gradually, don't result in the insulin surge that creates uh, uh, extra fat storage, and, they, and most importantly too, they support healthy bacteria in your colon called your microbiome. We'll come back to that in a second. 
And a broad variety is important. Dr. Bolschwitz says eat 30 different plant foods every week. It's not hard to do. I have a pull up a big salad with 15 different ones there almost every day. Uh, and these uh, will lower your risk of several cancers, especially colon cancer. Think fiber in every bite and processed, uh, avoid processed foods that are devoid of fiber. Uh, for a little more detail on this one, when a woman is pregnant, we say she is eating for two. And in reality, as I mentioned, we're all, all the time eating for 38 trillion in one. You're the one, <laughs> and these bacteria in your colon are the 38 trillion microbes which work synergistically. You give them a pretty good deal, keep them warm, carry them around, feed them, and in return they form short-chain fatty acids that support immune function, uh, help balance hormones, they manage toxins, nourish your colon. Uh, in fact, the colon cells are the ones that get their energy from short-chain fatty acids. Uh, they lower inflammation, not only in your colon, but throughout your body, produce other nutrients, signal satiety, uh, and aid in nutrient absorption. In contrast, if you starve them, they create inflammation, toxins increase the reabsorption of estrogen, creating challenges like precocious puberty, uh, menopausal challenges, uh, PCOS for women, and breast cancer, uh, induce inflammation and create leaky gut and increase the risk for autoimmune disease. So what do they eat? The average American only gets about 15 grams of fiber a day. Our poultry dietary guidelines call for twice that. And only 3% of Americans even meet that amount. Um, the minimum goal should be 60. And uh, as Dr. Greger mentioned last night, uh, if you look at paleo poop and what uh, modern hunter-gatherer tribes give, they get 100 plus grams per day. So it's our greatest nutrient deficiency is fiber. Um, Fiber per 2,000 calories is prevalent in all these healthy plant foods. You see the middle one there, white bread being minimal, and of course none in animal foods, sugar, and oils. So here's starvation for the average American eating lots of these foods, nourishment for those of us eating plant-based, and the results are clear. As the amount of fiber in the, in the diet goes up, down goes the incidence of heart disease, breast cancer, diabetes, and you could fill in other ones here, gallstones, uh, prostate enlargement, um, uh, acne, a whole no host of things that are related to the fiber relation. And it does, there's no evidence that it should stop here, keep going, likely would be even less. Uh, so fiber is critical. And an additional note, many of the phytonutrients are attached to the fiber, and they're only released when your microbiome munches away the fiber. So uh, in order to get those, you need both the fiber, eat the whole food, uh, and the, the plant part, which has the phytonutrients. So refining brown rice to white rice, or whole wheat to wheat fl white flour, uh, juicing fruits and veggies, loses many not only of the fiber and the nourishment for your microbiome, but the phytonutrients that are attached to those. So eat whole food. <laughs> Uh, last year I shared Jet PT4's uh, um, definition of phytonutrients. I really like this. They're natural compounds and found in plants. The vibrant colors are there. Uh, they have anti-inflammatory and mood-boosting effects that play a crucial role in overall health, reducing risk of many chronic diseases, supporting immune function. They may have, have, have to anti-aging effects. So include a broad variety of fruits and vegetables. Wednesday I said that AI is going to revolutionize and change our understanding of not only nutrition science, but healthcare. And part of that is it's going to be giving information like this that most people have no idea about, but it's critical for them to know. Many have heard of Michael Pollan's famous saying, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, well, I think we're all partly a fan of that, uh, but not really. Uh, eat food, we know he means eat real food, but a lot of people think of Twinkies and Krispy Kreme donuts and eggs as food, and so they say, okay, I'm eating food. Uh, not too much, well, that's if you're going to portion control because you're eating high calorie processed animal foods, but if you eat like we do, eat lots, you know, <laughs> go wild. And uh, mostly plants, well, you could be eating mostly plants and still have 49% animal, right? Uh, so, I, I, I don't know, I, 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 he said he got in trouble from both camps. Us vegans said, you're not going far enough, and those people who like the standard American diet said, you're being way too, way too extreme here. Well, I just simplified it, fiber in every bite. <laughs> right? Fiber comes in whole plant foods, not in processed and animal foods, so uh, we're going to, Michael Pollan, watch out. <laughs>
Uh, number five is be active, uh, play, make it fun, do what you like. Um, 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week, say 30 minutes, five or more days a week. Um, choose activities you enjoy so you'll be able to stick with it. Uh, use the stairs instead of the elevators, park further away, take the scenic route. Um, oh, this is me when I was 60 down in Cabo. I don't know if you've ever seen this call, it's called a flyboard. Um, I, I like to be active, I like to, I like to do things adventurously. It might not be for everybody, but um, here's a video. We'll see if we can get it to work. Uh, just a short one. Uh, the, uh, the guy in the jet ski over there is sending the jets to my, my feet, and it's shooting out at, I think, 3,000 gallons per minute, uh, flying me uh, 10 to 15 feet above the ocean. Uh, whoa! <laughs> this was my first time I'd ever done it. Uh, the guy said I did really well. But uh, that, that's my way of, of having fun, of skiing, of scuba diving, of being adventurous. Um, but do what works for you. Uh, for example, this uh, right here is my wife uh, sitting uh, peacefully on the beach over there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and her idea of good activity is, is walking the beach. So it's good. Either, either way is fine. Uh, but but uh, you want to be able to do what you want to do. Uh, the benefits are multiple. We don't need to, to review those in too much detail. Uh, the recommendation for adults is at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate or 75 to 100 minutes of vigorous activity, along with two or more days of strength training, resistance training. You can use bands or weights, uh, calisthenics or yoga. The more physical activity, the more benefit, but any is better than none at all. In fact, some of the greatest benefits come from going from zero to a little. So don't let, uh, hold, don't let couch potatoing hold you back. Set specific attainable goals and have fun with it. Exercise shouldn't be a chore, it should be fun. Next is your environment. Avoid poisons, contaminants. Don't smoke anything. Uh, uh, avoid even second or third hand smoke, which is places where people have been smoking and it's in the room uh, and the curtains. Avoid other recreational drugs uh, and eat organic when possible. I prefer a solid carbon water filter to remove the chloramines and contaminants um, and other end toxins. Uh, again, we don't need to review smoking, but some people are still confused about alcohol, um, heart conditions, um, several different cancers, immune suppression, uh, brain uh, dysfunction over time. Again, not all or nothing, but the less the better. Next is sleep well. Uh, got my sleep mask right here to remind us to uh, keep it dark, uh, cool, and conducive to sleep. Um, uh, have a wind down routine before bedtime. Uh, limit your uh, naps and use your bed for sleeping only, not TV or, or other. Uh, well, maybe one other thing, but uh, <laughs> keep, keep, keep your sleep time uh, precious just like you would because with that sleep, you'll decrease your risk of several chronic diseases and have better overall health. Remember, too, that like all the keys, they work together with each other, but perhaps this one more than many of the others. If you don't eat well, you don't sleep well. If you don't sleep, you may make poor eating decisions. If you exercise, you actually sleep better. And if you don't, uh, you're not able to exercise. If you're taking substances that interfere with your brain health, alcohol, nicotine, you don't sleep as well. And you may make poor decisions on doing those things. It's stressful to be not sleeping. Uh, we all know that. And, um, and conversely, good quality sleep helps us to better build our resilience and manage stress. And finally, sleep uh, helps give us a space where we can develop those healthy relationships. And having those helps us sleep better. So all these work together, um, but uh, sleep is really a cornerstone pillar. So pay attention to it. Here's some good resources, American Sleep Association, AASM, and a good book uh, by Dr. Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. And it's not only about why, it's the how and uh, what you can do too to help your sleep get better. Next is take time to play, relax, and connect with others. Um, balance your priorities, uh, set attainable goals, um, make fun, uh, enjoy time for laughter. Norman Cousins' book, Laughter is the Best Medicine, was one of my early inspirations back in the 70s. Uh, take time to spend time with those who share these goals. One of the great things about every year at Summerfest, we get together with our friends and family and, and enjoy time with each other. But this is critical. Uh, and we all kind of have heard the statistics on the downside. Chronic loneliness increases risk of stroke, uh, depression, uh, myocardial infarctions. Um, and in contrast, um, playing, relaxing, connecting through volunteering, gratitude journaling, 
connecting resource centers, religious or spiritual connections, helping out at an animal shelter, music, display, community events, celebrations, take a course, all these things add up to a better life and better health. Uh, helpful resources on this one, uh, if you want my email, can, you can get those. Um, and then on the last part of my eight keys, I put helpful resources. And on Wednesday, I, I mentioned the ones that are highlighted here. Uh, these so will, will be in the slide set for links to those. Uh, Jumpstart, PCRM, ACLM, Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group, Forks Over Knives, and Peapot. All great resources that can help you on this. And of course, one of our favorite is nutritionfacts.org uh, as a great resource for not only um, the science behind it, but a non-conflicted approach. Uh, I also encourage my patients to watch several documentaries. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen Forks Over Knives, Game Changers, Eating You Alive, uh, Vegetated, uh, Code Blue by Dr. Sarai Stancic. Dr. Greger's book, How Not to Die, is really one of the best I've seen. Uh, I've been studying this for 43 years. Uh, and um, re Reclaim Your Health, um, the Jump Start, which Ted's going to cover in a minute, and um, my virtual seminar. Uh, so that kind of completes my eight keys and let's see the bottom line then as eat as if your life and your health uh, depend on it because they do uh, and it's not just your current health and life but your future self uh, and the kind of analogy i use here is we can all understand that this tree growing in healthy non-compacted nutrient rich uh, moist soil is going to grow healthy and strong whereas this one compacted dry lack of nutrients is going to be anemic and unhealthy well, put a human being in there as an organism and you see a similar kind of a sense here. If people are living a whole food plant-based lifestyle with some daily exercise, managing their stress, social connectedness, they'll have a, a microenvironment rich in phytonutrients, a healthy microbiome with strong blood flow, levels of systemic inflammation, healthy organs, and a vital, active, healthy, successful life. In contrast, most people live over here sedentary isolation process in animal foods, which leads to microbiome stress, uh, ischemia, low blood flow, and systemic inflammation, organ dysfunction. And I just see it every day, people in my office, people coming in, sitting there complaining of fatigue and obesity, and they don't want meds, but they have to. And that's all largely preventable. So thank you for being part of the team that's helping people to understand this. Um, it's so important. And uh, there's my family, my two girls. Uh, I showed you the picture of her at the beginning, and now the grandkids are here, uh, Finney, Calla, and, and Emmy. So this is what I do it for. I, I do it for myself, for them, for their future, for the animals. It's, and, and finally, with uh, John McDougall's quote, day by day, you'll be making your best effort at, at creating a better health. Each day by day, you'll find yourself looking better, weighing less, feeling more energy and confidence. It doesn't happen without effort. But that's what makes it great. You earn the right to be healthier, happier, more vital, beautiful, and alive. Enjoy it. You deserve to look feeling great. Uh, thank you, John. Rest in peace. And uh, thank you for the legacy you have left us all. Uh, and we are uh, grateful for everything that you gave us. Um, here is my uh, current practice situation with my style medicine primary care in Ann Arbor. And uh, finally, uh, if you were here last year, I just, one of my favorite stories is Alice. About uh, two years ago, um, a medical assistant came in and she said, the lady in room nine, she just um, wants to say goodbye. She's here for medical wellness. Uh, and I said, what? And she said, well, she, she's pretty healthy. She's not sure she needs to be here. She's here for a medical wellness. She wants to say goodbye. So never mind, I'll figure it out. I go into room nine and, this, and Alice stands up and she goes, Dr. Brakey, I'm moving up to Traverse City, so I won't be seeing you anymore, but I just want to thank you. I said, Alice, what'd I do? She said, well, Dr. Brakey, 35 years ago, you inspired me to go plant-based in my eating and take good care of myself. And look at me now, I'm 68, I'm normal weight, I've got no medications, I feel vital, active, and healthy, and I get to retire and go up north and garden and be with my family. She said, you gave me a better life. I'm like, What's it? Wow, Alice, you know, thank you. I, I appreciate that, but I may have inspired you, but you did the heavy lifting. You know, you learned how to cook differently. You stood up to relatives who said you were going to die. You made it through holidays. You, you stuck through it. That You did the hard part. She said, well, I wouldn't have done it without you. I said, okay, joint credit. And we hugged, and she's, she's doing well now all these years later. But that's why I stick with it. That's why I uh, come and try to inspire others at whatever stage they're at to keep with it, to move further beyond, and to choose health. They go together, health, success, vitality, future wellness.
faithfulness. So go forth, um, be like Alice, uh, whatever part you're on your journey at, um, there's no judgment. But have time for no questions because I used all my time. And, <laughs> and I do have one more talk tomorrow morning on plant-based pediatrics. If you want, we'll leave some time for questions there. And thank you, Nav. Thank you all. Happy 50th. <laughs> thank you.